Okay, AJ, um, you're going to talk to us a little bit tonight about anaplasmosis. Give us an update. Tell us if there's anything new. Um, of course, maybe Cassandra can be able to stay around. Maybe she'll want to listen to how we're supposed to control the ticks that also help carry, uh, carry anaplasmosis. So, AJ, I'll turn it over to you. Okay, fantastic. So, uh, no, I think this is a, uh, you know, it's, it's a, uh, you know, covering uh, external parasites and fly control right before anaplas, you know, it's, uh, I think those topics kind of go hand in hand and will kind of clear, clear the, uh, the air with uh, some of the misperceptions and some of the flies and uh, which ones we're concerned about anaplas, which ones that aren't. Uh, but yes, I, tonight I'd give a brief, uh, brief overview of anaplasmosis. I'm sure many of you are already, uh, you know, aware of this disease and have, and unfortunately may have had, uh, felt the impact of this disease through Kansas. Uh, but I will kind of go through anaplas a little bit and then and kind of a, a little bit about what's new. Unfortunately, there's not too much new uh, on the realm of control or treatment, uh, but we will kind of cover, cover our basis here tonight because it's a nice review going into the summer months where we see most of our, our disease issues with anaplas. So what is it? Anaplasmosis is a bacterial disease, okay? Uh, it's called, caused by a bacteria that's called uh, anaplasma marginale. Uh, it actually infects red blood cells, okay? So that's where this, that's the host cell uh, that this uh, specific bacteria attaches to. And that's where it thrives and that, that's kind of how it lives. Uh, so it does infect the red blood cells, okay? The red blood cells also carry oxygen through, through the body, okay? Uh, so what happens is an animal gets exposed, the bacteria starts to replicate. It infects and invades our red blood cells of our cows. And there is an immune response. Our cows, when they find these red blood cells that have this anaplasma marginale in them, uh, they're abnormal. And because they're abnormal, their body's own functional immune system will try to remove those red blood cells uh, to clear them out of the system, their system as, as best as they can. And that often, often happens in the spleen, okay? That's kind of the blood filtering organ uh, where the cattle will pull a, a massive amount of these red blood cells out of their system uh, to be able to help combat this disease. Unfortunately, their immune system can be so strong against this organism, they will pull so many red blood cells out of the system that they develop anemia, okay? So anemia is very low uh, red blood cells floating through the system. Uh, the animals themselves actually lose their ability to carry oxygen. So they essentially, they, they get hypoxic, which is very low oxygen levels uh, within the blood. Uh, they just don't have the carrying capacity anymore. Uh, so anemia is severe loss of red blood cells, and that's what can occur, and that's where we see some of the clinical signs of anaplasmosis. Uh, so life cycle, uh, they, I'll talk a little bit about ticks uh, a little bit later, uh, but this is what it looks like. You know, we, uh, we may have uh, an animal that, uh, or a tick that may be a, the vector and the transmitter of this disease, uh, where they, have, they actually host and, and harbor that organism, and they'll feed on an animal, and it infects their red blood cells or their erythrocytes. Uh, within that, the body starts to pull those, those infected uh, red blood cells out of the system, they get anemia, and then we can see our clinical signs. That's kind of what happens internally. So a, a few intricacies with anaplasmosis that I, I'd like to start with, okay? That's what happens on the inside. Let's look at our herd basis. Uh, number one, all of our animals within the herd are at risk of infection, okay? So they can be exposed, they can get infected, okay? So, it, and that's regardless of age that they do have the opportunity to be, become infected. However, just because they became infected does not mean that all animals are gonna be uh, impacted the same way. So a lot of this has to do with immune function and the ability of the animal to regenerate its own red blood cells. That is why mostly our older cows, our older bulls are mature animals. Uh, because of their vast size and their mature immune system, they pull way more red blood cells out of the system. They're much more efficient with their immune function. On top of that, their red blood cell uh, production ability uh, to be able to regenerate red blood cells for the system is, is not at the same level as a young calf, okay? Uh, so for those two reasons, that's the number one reason why we see more clinical signs with specifically our older cows and bulls is because of those two factors, um, a more potent immune system 
and they can't regenerate red blood cells as fast. So that's why we see most commonly our older animals four years and up. Uh, that's where we see clinical cases. Uh, incubation, okay, so just for clarity, uh, incubation means how long it takes from an animal to be exposed to actually show clinical signs. OK, uh, so incubation, think of it as, you know, baking a cake. It takes a while for it to rise and everything else. So that incubation is just replication. OK, replication of this organism inside the body, infecting the red blood cells. So they get exposed to a very small amount, but then it starts to divide and become a much larger amount that can cause disease. So that incubation in general is about a month. OK. Uh, where we can understand this is kind of our, our trace back, okay? If, if you uh, routinely see clinical signs of anaplasmosis, uh, usually late summer, okay, well, they got exposed a month, about a month prior, okay? So that, that's a good working understanding, and it can take longer. It can take up to 100 days to incubate, uh, but in general, it's about a month, okay? So it, it's a good idea to keep that in your back pocket that if you're seeing clinical cases, Something happened where they were exposed about a month, uh, month prior. Now, once our animals become exposed, a couple of things can, uh, can happen, okay? We talked about, yes, it, it depends on age. Yes, it depends on immune function, uh, but really a couple of things can happen. Uh, number one, the animal gets exposed. They get the, the bacterial infection goes through the system. Uh, their body kind of, uh, you know, defends it. It mounts a little bit of an immune response. We never see clinical signs, but they become a carrier, okay? Uh, so no clinical signs in a carrier state. Or two, the animal gets exposed. We actually see clinical signs about a month later, which I'll talk about clinical signs here in a little bit. So the animal physically gets sick. Now, if they get sick, we do have therapy that we can treat those animals. We can get them over uh, many of these animals. We can get over uh, that, that this disease. Now, if they heal, they will become a carrier. Okay, so basically, if they be if they get exposed, they will be a carrier, whether they show clinical signs or not. Unfortunately, a lot of our animals, uh, especially our older naive cows and bulls, if they get exposed, there is a, a, a potential for them to die. Okay, just due to the, the, the severe anemia caused in the animal uh, that they, yes, they, it, it can be deadly uh, with this disease. Uh, so if they get infected, if they survive, they will be a, a chronic carrier for the rest of their life. So I, I think that's a, that's a good thing to understand. Now, I, I guess one thing I did mention, um, if an animal be, uh, gets infected and becomes a carrier, they generally have very long lasting, almost lifetime, uh, life, lifetime immunity against anaplasma, okay? Uh, so that means they're essentially protected from getting the disease again, okay? Uh, some kinks that can get thrown in that is if a mature animal gets severely, their immune system gets compromised, they, they're sick from other issues, they get severely stressed, they potentially could succumb to the disease later in life, uh, but it's relatively rare. Okay, so animals that, that have been exposed, uh, generally, uh, generally they're pretty protected for, for uh, the rest of their lives. Uh, so that's, that's what's meant with uh, the lifelong carrier with protective immunity, is they generally, they generally have a pretty good immune function against that organism uh, for the rest of their life. So clinical signs, brief review of clinical signs. Usually the number one thing that producers see the first time that they, they run into anaplas issues is dead, dead cow, okay? We have uh, either one or multiple animals that have died within a relatively short period of time, maybe a month or, month or so, uh, that we start seeing these animals drop off. Um, now, that, that's kind of our first clinical sign. Once we start seeing that, we start uh, examining the animals a little bit closer. We, they're all out in pasture. We want to try to figure out what's going on. Um, if we see one that's alive, okay, that it is in clinical signs, uh, they will be anemic, okay? So they're low in oxygen. When they get low in oxygen, they try to breathe faster and breathe deeper to be able to bring in more oxygen. Uh, so they can be open mouth panting. Uh, they can get a little reckless, okay, uh, as it progresses due to the, the low oxygen level. But usually an animal that gets really low oxygen, they get, they get dull. They're tired. They're lethargic. Uh, they're dopey. They're not acting quite right. Something, they look off, okay, and that's often what we recognize. However, when we go 
and try to move these animals and get a closer look, they become extremely aggressive, uh, almost at the snap of a finger. And that aggressiveness, it could be the nicest animal that you can bucket feed out of your, uh, out of your herd. If they get low on oxygen, uh, the defense mechanism in their brain is to attack. Okay, and that's where we can see extremely uh, aggressive animals that'll, uh, you know, attack the truck, attack the tractor, attack the four wheeler, uh, you know, run people up fences. Uh, I've known several produ uh, producers that have been injured when trying to uh, intervene and, and try to treat animals with anaplast. So, uh, and it's due to the low oxygen. Okay, so it's, I mean, it's not their fault, but we do have to be cautious uh, to be able to, you know, some of these clinical cases can get pretty nasty with this. So it, it, it's always good to keep that in mind. Uh, the question that comes up a lot is, can anaplasmosis cause uh, abortions and termination of pregnancy? And the answer is yes. Um, and that's kind of a basic defense mechanism of, of the body is, you know, the uterus and, and growing the fetus during gestation takes a lot of energy, takes a lot of oxygen, takes a lot of nutrients from the system. An animal that, that is already hypoxic and anemic and doesn't have enough blood flow, uh, they will sacrifice the pregnancy. Mother Nature kind of tries to protect itself and it, 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 it will sacrifice reproduction to be able to save itself. So yes, we, we can see some, uh, some abortions in those animals, uh, you know, getting close to having a clinical case. Uh, so that, that is something that we can see. Uh, other things that we'll see externally is, well, it's called uh, icterus or jaundice, okay? The animals can actually turn yellow as the, uh, the mucous membranes around the eyes. Uh, inside the vulvar lips, if you're going into preg check or AI, uh, that there'll be a yellow tinge, uh, or they can be very uh, white, okay? And that's from acute anemia where they lost a bunch of red blood cells rapidly. Uh, the yellowing actually happens because the body has to break down all, that, all those red blood cells. Uh, and when that, when that happens, it kind of builds up in the liver. Um, and because of that, that, that's where we see some of the, the jaundice issues, okay? Some of the icterus or the yellowing. It's just due to a backup of cleaning out all of that, uh, kind of all of the, the gunk and the material from breaking down those red blood cells. So as an example here, this is this yellowing of the inside of the eye, uh, that, that's jaundice, okay? That, that's icterus. Uh, or on the other extreme is, is very pale and white. Okay, the inside, the mucous membrane should be relatively pink, uh, not bright red. You know, sometimes they're a little bit more red, but they will be, it, these jump out at you, either the yellow or the white, they're extreme, you know, extreme one or the other. Um, and then obviously we, you know, the, the dead cattle and pasture, uh, yes, though that, that is most definitely a clinical sign and usually one of the first ones that we see uh, while our animals are out on pasture. So anaplas. Where is it? How much of it do we have? Uh, do we have it in Kansas? Absolutely. It's actually been documented in every region of Kansas, even in far Northwest and Southwest. Okay, so yes, it is here. Here in, uh, in, in your areas, whether, uh, you know, this, is, this was a study that was done a couple of years ago to look at prevalence of anaplasmosis within herds. Uh, this percentage is not uh, individual animals, this percentage is the percentage of herds that are affected within those animals that were uh, in, in those areas that were tested. Uh, so yes, here we get closer to, you know, east, east central to, um, or, and uh, southeast. Uh, yes, we do have a, a pretty large majority of our herds that do have at least one animal that, that would be a chronic carrier or, uh, or infected with anaplasmosis. So yes, we have it. Yes, it's in the area. Yes, it's being transmitted around, around the area. So um, that is the disease. Yes, we have it in the area. Uh, those are the clinical signs. Uh, I'd like to start a little bit about what do we do with a clinical case? Okay, what treatment options do we have? Uh, then talk a little bit about control, okay, and, and wrap up for the evening. So uh, for treatment, for years and years and years, the only thing that we've had available to truly treat active cases of anaplasmosis has been injectable oxytetracycline, okay? This is LA-200, this is biomyosin, this is LA-300, uh, many of those oxytetracycline injectable products, okay? Um, we still have the availability of that injectable oxygen tetracycline, okay? Uh, that, that is still a treatment for anaplasmosis. However, 
recently, uh, within the past a little over a year, uh, we do have a new treatment for active clinical cases of anaplasmosis. These are the animals that are showing some of those clinical signs. Uh, we do have the availability to use a new product for treatment of anaplasmosis. Uh, the product is actually called uh, Batril CA1. Okay, and Batril, uh, we, I'm sure many of you are already uh, comfortable with Batril. Uh, so Batril is a fluoroquinolone antibiotic. You don't have to remember that, but usually we use it to treat, uh, you know, calves with pneumonia. Uh, this same uh, chemical in a new formulation called the CA1, this, this is a conditionally approved product. Uh, so it, it is not fully approved by the, uh, the FDA uh, yet for anaplasmosis, but there's enough literature to back the usage of this, so they were able to get a conditional approval uh, and a new label uh, to be able to treat for anaplasmosis. Uh, it is a single dose. It's not the uh, the multitude, uh, the uh, multiple options of do uh, dose range that uh, we we have with traditional Batril, and it is only under veterinary prescription. Okay, so uh, Batril CA1, that's kind of the one new thing that I wanted to make sure everybody was aware of today. If that's something that if you've been uh, battling uh, active cases, uh, and this is something that you, you will have to talk with your local veterinarian about that to see if that is something that they recommend, or if this is something that, uh, would, you know, uh, it would be beneficial for your operation. So if it would, and that's that conversation with your local veterinarian. Now, Regardless of treatment, whether we're treating with oxytetracycline or Batril CA1, a uh, couple of things to keep in mind. Uh, treatment can either kill the organism or, or dumb it down where uh, you know, it's no longer replicated. So we can take care of the organism with treatment. However, the animal still has to regenerate its own red blood cells. Okay, And that is really what dictates success or failure of that treatment. If we treat them too late in the disease process, okay, they can still die. Uh, we, we can have phenomenal, we, you know, we have good treatments available for those clinical, uh, clinical signs. However, a lot of it has to do with how much red blood cell uh, th those animals have already lost, okay? So if they don't have enough to regenerate, um, it, that, that's really what di dictates our success. Uh, the other thing to consider is it takes a couple of weeks to recover. Uh, regenerating red blood cells and, and getting the oxygen levels back in the body, uh, it takes time, okay? It doesn't happen overnight. Uh, red blood cells are made in the, uh, you know, in the bone marrow. So again, it, it doesn't happen overnight, it takes a little bit of time. Uh, they can get over that compromise, but uh, it, does, it does take a little time to get them over this. Um, so our treatments can be very successful against the organism, but the animal still has to heal on its own. Um, uh, another thing to consider, just because we treat them doesn't mean we have cleared all of that organism from that, that animal, okay? Uh, unlike other bacterial infections where we treat for a cure, uh, we are treating the clinical signs. We don't have the availability to be able to treat to, to virtually clear that animal of the infection. Uh, we can treat and cure the disease, but the infection will stay. They will still be a carrier after treatment. Okay, so I, I hope that uh, I hope that makes sense. So really, this this is where we spend most of our time control. Okay, uh, we truly don't have any uh, true prevention measures to prevent anaplas. What we do is what we do have is control measures, and that's multimodal, multifactorial. A lot of a lot of options that we can do to implement to help control some of the impacts of anaplas. Okay, because it's in the area, uh, you know, we can't eradicate it. Uh, it, it's it, it's kind of here and it's here to stay, but we can control it to minimize the impacts on our operation. And that's really the realistic goal uh, for the vast majority of this is kind of a, a, a control measure to be able to mitigate. Okay. Uh, it all starts with fomite. And for, we talked about vectors earlier. Uh, Dr. Olds mentioned vectors of transmitting uh, disease. Well, there's also fomites and fomites are inanimate ob objects. And this is us, people. Uh, so this is fomite control or people control. <laughs> uh, so what we do, the management uh, that we do can actually impact the spread of uh, anaplasmosis. Um, one of the biggest measures that we can do is change needles in between each injection between our animals. Um, we, there was a study that was done here at K-State a, a handful of years ago that actually showed uh, if we don't change our needles between animals and we go in, if we, it, 
vaccinate one animal that is a carrier, the small amount of blood inside that needle going into the next animal is enough to transmit the organism, the anaplasm organism. Uh, so there's a 60% chance that if we don't change that needle, uh, we can inadvertently transmit anaplast to the next animal. Okay, so uh, something to keep in mind. Uh, anything that comes in contact with blood has the opportunity to transmit uh, this bacterial infection to the next animal. So uh, ear taggers, tattoo pliers, castration equipment, anything that comes in contact, uh, OB sleeves from uh, rectally palpating, anything that comes in contact with blood uh, that goes to a next animal has the opportunity to uh, transmit this, this disease. Other steps for control, vectors, okay? This is actually the insect as the vector. I mentioned a little bit about ticks. Uh, so ticks, uh, mainly are the American dog tick, okay? It is a biologic vector of anaplasmosis. What that means is it's an amplifier, okay? The tick during its life cycle, and Dr. Olds could talk about the life cycle way better than I can, but the tick will feed on the, on the cow uh, that is infected with anaplasm. will pick up small amounts of that organism into its midgut. Uh, the tick, after its blood meal, falls off, okay? And uh, goes through the, its next cycle of, uh, of reproduction and everything else. Uh, but that tick, the bacteria doesn't go away. It actually gets up into the salivary glands of the tick and it amplifies to a massive amount. So the next cow that comes by that might be naive, the tick will latch onto and take another blood meal. But when it does, it injects all that uh, salivary uh, gland material with a lot of that organ that it's amplified. So it picked up very little on its first feeding and now it's spreading a massive amount. That's what it, what's meant as a biologic vector, is it amplifies this organism. Uh, now our other blood feeding uh, uh, flies, they do have the opportunity, they could, there is potential for them to transmit anaplasm, okay? But it's a mechanical transfer. Uh, so it's, it's direct from one animal to another uh, with a, within a relatively short amount of time that the bacteria is just on their uh, mouth feeding parts. Um, where they feed on one animal and go directly and feed on another, there is that potential. Uh, notice I have uh, the stable flies. Because they spend, they don't feed on the same animal and they bounce back and forth to animals and feed on their legs, there is potential to be a, have a mechanical transfer of anaplast. Uh, as, as well as our uh, tabinids, the, the horse flies and things like that, they're really nasty, voracious eaters where they... Uh, tear skin open and just because their mouth parts, I mean, they get really dirty. And so they can mechanically transfer from one animal to another. Um, thankfully, you know, yes, these are still a, a vector. Uh, they're much less efficient at transfer of the uh, organism as opposed to the dog tick. Uh, the dog tick actually lives underneath uh, on the neck, underneath the, uh, the front legs. You'll find it up and around the udder. Uh, loves to live on the underbelly and underside of, uh, of cattle, which makes it kind of difficult to treat. Um, it, it's not to be confused with the uh, Gulf Coast tick that we see on the ears, on the ears of cattle that make them cause gotcha and they'll be bleeding and really nasty. Uh, that's the Gulf Coast tick. Uh, so it's, it's a different tick species, but uh, the one we're most concerned about is the American dog tick. Uh, last about, uh, you know, two, two more slides and just kind of finishing up here for control. Uh, antibiotics in the feed, okay? Feeding CTC in our mineral or in our feed to control anaplasmosis. Yes, we have that availability, okay? It is under veterinary feed directive, okay? So uh, you do have to get a VFD from your veterinarian and, and keep that documentation for a couple years. Uh, but yes, there is availability. We can still feed this. Okay, it is a, it, it reduces the like, it's meant to reduce the likelihood of a clinical infection. It doesn't sterilize the animals uh, of the infection. It doesn't uh, prevent infection. The animals can still get exposed naturally in the environment, uh, but it is used to reduce the likelihood of a clinical case. Okay, that, that's, that's our goal if we use CTC in the feed. Um, dosages, uh, we can either have hand-fed mineral or a daily delivered ration where we're feeding on a daily basis at a half milligram per pound uh, body weight per day. Uh, or we do have uh, some free choice mineral uh, formulations that, that are out there with a, a slightly different range, and that's all formulated by the FDA. Uh, outside of those options, whether feeding, hand-fed mineral, or uh, free choice, you know, no other options are, are legal when it comes to dosage rates for that, for anaplast. Okay, so that, that's, that is a step for, uh, of control. Lastly, uh, the vaccine, 
Okay, I'm sure many of you have heard about the vaccine or have questions about the vaccine that's currently available. Um, so currently there is an anaplasmosis vaccine. Um, it is an experimental vaccine. It is not fully licensed, okay, uh, but it is available. And it's available in several different states, Kansas being one of them. It's actually created by University Products LLC uh, at Louisiana State University. Okay, so it is created uh, down there. It was formulated off one of the old, uh, I, I believe, uh, Fort Dodge products uh, that, that used to be marketed uh, that had a full license. Uh, so I think they're using the same strain for that, if I, if I remember that correctly. So it is experimental. It is available. Uh, unfortunately, since it's not fully licensed, uh, we don't have all the efficacy uh, information. Okay, so the challenge trials and things like that, we just don't have that. Uh, however, it has been uh, proven safe in cattle. Okay, so that, that is one thing that we're, uh, we're pretty confident with that yes, it's safe. Um, it doesn't prevent natural exposure. Okay, but what it does is it, it similar to our CTC, it seems to reduce the likelihood of a clinical case. Um, and that that's, a, I, I've heard of numerous uh, anecdotal reports from producers, veterinarians uh, that have used it and, and things seem to do pretty well. Okay. Um, you know, I, I, we don't have any hard data uh, behind that. So I, I want to say that with uh, full clarity, uh, but there, there are a lot of producers that do use it. Uh, the, the vaccine, it's uh, two doses the first time you use it, and then a dose every subsequent year for, for each animal. Um, it's, it's, it can be pretty expensive, seven, eight dollars a dose. Uh, so it'd be about 16, you know, if you call it uh, $16 the first year per head, um, you know, and then seven or eight dollars, uh, you know, every year after. So it can get a little pricey, but it is available out there. If you're curious about that, you know, talk with your local veterinarian, see if that's something that could be, uh, you know, useful in your situation. Uh, new, new vaccines, there's a lot of things in the work, okay? Uh, trying some new technologies to get a more efficacious vaccine that's about to hit the market. Again, nothing is on the direct horizon, okay? Uh, nothing with it probably within the next year or so, but... There are some things uh, working, we are working towards it, not just at K-State, but in numerous uh, universities around the US uh, to be able to uh, uh, try to get some better information on that. Um, so I won't talk about that, but really what do you do with anaplast? Okay, uh, there are some options you can do. Uh, try to figure out your pre uh, prevalence. Your veterinarian can run some blood tests to figure out how much is in your herd. Okay, and then it comes down to how much you want to spend for control measures, whether you want to vaccinate, use CTC, possibly uh, do some other things on vector control. And regardless, it's a multimodal situation to be able to control as much as you can. Okay, so again, your local vet will be able to help you determine that risk and, and formulate some, um, some ideas for control. So uh, with that, I don't want to keep you all too long. Uh, thank you for your attention. I'd be happy to answer any questions and, uh, and we'll kind of finish up for the evening. So do we have any questions? Well, a AJ, I have a question for you. Yeah. If it can be transferred via needle, you know, a lot of times we work our, uh, we work our cattle in the spring, you know, but the disease itself really doesn't show up oftentimes until late July, maybe August, maybe early September. So is it really taking that long from those in from those needles to, to cause that infection? It, it can, um, you know, I had, you know, it, 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 a lot of it has to do with uh, the infective dose. Okay. Um, so disease occurs much quicker if they get exposed to a massive amount of the uh, bacteria. Okay. Um, however, with the tip of a needle, it's, it's, it's a very small amount. It's a very minute amount, but it, it, it is, enough to start to replicate and take seed within within the body. Uh, so uh, realistically, it could be that more than likely it is our external vectors, okay, our, our ticks and everything else uh, that expose that the animals get exposed to during the grazing season. That's why we see most of the, uh, the, the threat and potential of clinical signs at the end of summer, okay, kind of at the end of uh, vector season. Uh, that, that, that's our, our biggest potential for some of that disease transfer. Uh, so I talked about needles. Yes, the potential is there. We have proven that potential. Uh, can it take a little bit longer than a month? Absolutely. 
Okay, uh, so usually it's a it's it's a multitude of these different things, and it's hard to pinpoint that that long after exactly what it came from. Uh, but if we understand what truly transmits it, uh, we we can do a little bit better at controlling it from multiple multiple avenues. Well, there's another question that came in, and and uh, it wants to know about is there are there control measures out there for ticks, and will and and I have one that I'll add to this. Does garlic reduce the amount of ticks like it reduces flies? Uh, Dr. Olds, I, I, I'd be happy to turn that over to you and I can uh, fill in a couple other you know, pieces and we'll go from there. Sure. Um, so there are control measures for ticks. So your pyrethroids and your organophosphates will both, both work well on ticks if your population is susceptible. Tick populations are getting rapidly resistant to both of them. So we actually have markers now where we can genetically screen for our populations to test whether they're resistant or not. So a big problem in tick control right now is this massive explosion of resistance. But theoretically, pyrethroids and organophosphates will work if you use a spray or, or pour, pour on. Your, your ear tags will work against the Gulf Coast tick because it's in the ear. So it's right there where that ear tag is. If you have got an ear tag um, that you're trying to control any of the other tick species that are spread around the body, unless it's where the tick is where the ear tag is getting rubbed off onto the fur, it's not going to work. So we, we usually use sprays. Um, so I don't know that any people have tried um, to look at um, essential oils and stuff like that that will dissuade ticks. The problem with the tick is that once the, so a fly blood feeds for a short amount of time and then pulls out and then hangs out and then feeds again for a short period of time, pulls out and hangs out. That's quite different to your ticks because once your tick actually enters the, the, the host, so they cut a hole in the skin and then they insert their mouth parts and they actually cement themselves in there. And then they stay feeding for, depending on the tick, it can be seven days to up to a month. So once they're in there, they're in there. So it doesn't matter how much garlic or anything like that you put in. If that, that animal smelled good enough to put their mouth parts in, they're gonna <laughs> just keep feeding. And, and ticks are pretty host specific too. You know, they, they know the smell of the animal, they know what they're looking for, they know the area of the animal that they want to be on. So ticks, I would say, are actually harder to control than flies because once, the, once they're attached, they feed. And um, and you and, and so your especially your adult stage of your females if she gets a good solid meal they have this a critical mass that they have to feed up to, and once they've hit that critical mass even if they haven't fed completely if they get pulled off or they get dislodged they can lay thousands and thousands of eggs so you reproduce as as much as flies are good reproducers they lay smaller clutches of eggs multiple times. But an adult female tick will lay thousands and thousands of eggs. So theoretically, all you need is a single female to feed to repletion to keep your whole population going. So tick control is actually a little bit harder than fly control. And there's, there's very little you can do in terms of um, managing the environment for ticks. There is some evidence that suggests that burning may help. But then you've also got studies that show that actually burning makes it worse. So ticks are, ticks are about the hardest thing to control, in my, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. No, and I, I agree 100% that they're extremely challenging. Uh, one thing that I will throw out about ticks, uh, especially if you have an, uh, animals that are infested and you are going to go to treat them, and you are treating with either a pyrethrin or, or uh, organophosphate spray, um, it, you know, that it's, it, we, we truly have to get good, good coverage on these animals. They're topical treated products. So that means the ticks actually have to come into contact with that, with that product. Uh, so that means, you know, getting them into the chute and we may have to be spraying underneath the belly around the udder and really getting good coverage around those animals. Uh, whether we're treating for the American dog tick, because that's kind of where they, they, they stay and that's where they feed, or if we're treating Gulf Coast ticks on the ears, we physically need to uh, spray those ears themselves. Um, and uh, the other thing to throw out is uh, cedar trees. The eastern red cedar, ticks love them. So uh, coming up in, with burn season, the more cedar trees you burn, the better. <laughs> and, and also... Um, uh, your tavern is also really like cedar trees. Um, and one thing I will also add with, with the spray, and this is true for any pesticide you use, correct dosage. I cannot emphasize how important correct dosage is. 
So it is so tempting to be like, oh, I'll just stretch it a little bit further. I'll just dilute it out a little bit more. That is the absolute worst thing you can do because what you're doing is you're giving them a diluted experience. You're giving them a taste of the pesticide, not enough to kill them, but just enough for them to start developing that resistance. So when you are using um, pesticides, make sure you're using them as label instructs you to. Make sure that they're stored properly because you, you don't want to have your product inadvertently degrading so you think you are giving them the correct dose, but actually you're underdosing them. So making sure that you give them the correct dose. This is not an area that you want to save any sense. You know, you, you use it well and use it strategically and make sure that you're applying it well. You know, take your time. You know, if half the product lands on the floor, that means half the product isn't on the animal, which means half the animal is exposed to this organism, which means half the organisms have the chance to develop resistance. So yeah, just make sure that you're applying it properly at the correct dosage. Okay. Um, AJ, there's another question that came in. It says, if we're going to natural herd immunity, why not keep using the same needle and, and vaccinate in that way and let them all get infected? Yeah, so ju just on the time, I didn't cover the idea of uh, endemic stability. Um, so those of you that don't, don't know, kind of endemic stability is basically ha happens in two different situations. One, we have very few animals that have anaplex. We have very few carriers. We have very low uh, in infection rates. Uh, the other situation is we have massive amounts of infection rates. I'm talking, you know, 95 plus percent of our mature cows have already been exposed, okay? And in good vector years, most of our calves get exposed that given year. Uh, so those are the two situations where there's potential for endemic stability. That means there's very few mature animals to get exposed, uh, so our death rates would be very low, okay? And most of our replacements under typical years of vector transfer, most of them would be exposed, okay? So then when we keep them in the herd, they already have that protective immunity. Um, the risk is if we don't have, as, uh, if we don't have high enough uh, prevalence within our herd, um, we might get around okay for an endemic stability until we have a massive wreck. Um, so the whole thing is understanding your prevalence before you start a, a program like that. Now, once you get to that, uh, you know, anaplas isn't the only uh, bloodborne pathogen that can be spread. I mean, we have uh, bovine leukemia virus or leukosis that can be transferred. Uh, you know, e even the USDA has come out, you know, recommending, you know, sw swapping out needles, uh, you know, between animals. Uh, it, it is a good biosecurity measure, uh, you know, but... I understand. Okay. Even with, you know, our, our BQA standards, it's, you know, it's uh, every 10 to 15 head, you know, changing needles out just for proper injection sites. Um, you know, but it, it, you know, using dirty, uh, dirty needles on purpose to be able to expose the rest of the cows. Uh, there's a lot of other bacterial issues floating around the blood. I, I wouldn't rely on the needle transfer to try to expose m most of your herd. <laughs> okay. So I, if, if, if that helps. Mm -hmm. I'll add another thing. I, I, I've worked on endemic stability and tuliariosis, which is a different tick-borne disease of cattle. Um, and I, I'm just fascinated by endemic stability and, and love doing studies on that. One of the key things with endemic stability is that um, what you really want is to have your calves expo get exposure from at low levels, preferably by the vector itself, because that's the most natural way to get it. So low, low levels, so ticks that have low levels of infection, which you naturally get when you have endemic stability, but that those calves are exposed to it while they are still um, on their mothers because their mothers have maternal antibodies because the mothers have already been infected for the most of their life. And so the mothers then pass those antibodies on. So what happens is they get a low, a low exposure to the parasite. They have the maternal antibodies to kind of help control things. And then they develop a natural immune response. It's very hard to set up good endemic stability in older animals by just keeping needles. So there's, there's, there's a safe way to establish endemic stability, and then there's a risky way to establish endemic stability. Um, in, in an ideal world, yeah, you, I, I would love a situation where we could have endemic stability because that's just the best way to reduce losses and keep this, this situation stable. But even so, even if you have endemic stability, if you 
get rid of your tick population completely and you remove that pressure, you can lose your immunity in a pretty quick period of time because as long as the animals aren't getting constant exposure to the parasite, they will actually lose their immunity. So it's, it's, it's a tricky situation to maintain. If you do it well, it, it's, it's pretty robust, but it's, it, it can, it's great, but it can go wrong pretty quickly. <laughs> And here in Kansas, the, the, you know, the, you know, weather variations we can have year to year where we could have multiple years that are, uh, you know, very conducive to the vectors for ticks and for flies and for everything else. But then we can have a period of time that we really hinder those populations just due to, due to the weather variability, um, which then we lose the pressure. We lose the, the things that we've gained within that endemic stability. So, uh, yes, in theory, it's fantastic. It's difficult to accomplish completely. So anyway, just fair warning on that. <laughs> okay. okay. And also, I mean, with endemic stability, you have to accept that you will have occasional losses. Even if endemic stability is there and it's good, there will still be one or two animals that are just immunocompromised because of other reasons. And even, you know, so it's, you will, it's not a surefire thing. I, I personally love it. I find it fascinating, but it, it's not, necessarily just as simple as immunity everybody's happy everybody's going to survive do we have any other questions yeah i have a question on feeding the mineral um, through a vfd is that something you would need to do year round or how does that work yeah no fantastic question so uh no the uh you know, the, the, C, the chlorotetracycline in the feed that is used for control of anaplasmosis uh, would not necessarily have to be fed year round, okay? Uh, uh, for, at that dosage rate, the most important time to feed it is, would be during the vector season, okay? So during the grazing season, during that period of time, into the, into the fall, where basically from, uh, from frost to frost, so to speak, would be your more critical time to uh, feed that product. Uh, so that does cheapen it up quite a bit that you would not have to feed that over the winter. Um, so again, yeah, you know, great question, but no, it's, it's, uh, it would really be targeted towards that vector season, which, which would be during the grazing season. Yeah. Are there any other questions? Well, you guys have been a really great audience this evening and, uh, uh, we really appreciate AJ and Cassandra coming on and, and talking to us. I think we had some really, really good uh, comments. Um, I do see we have one more uh, chat that just came in, and it's for Dr. Olds. Um, I have been refraining from using poron warmers for four or five years to let dung beetles reproduce and increase. Don't see much improvement. What do you think is going on? Um, so it, I guess it depends on the worm that you're using. I actually, I did see your email, Tim, and I was going to send you an email so we can get to the bottom of it because it's, it's super interesting. Depending on which product you're using, some of them actually, especially your macrocyclic lactones, tend to be a little bit easier for the, the, the um, dung beetles. So um, it depends on which species of dung beetles you have and um, a bunch of other things. So I'm going to send him an email tomorrow and get some more information. Um, like I said, I'm new to the, the dung beetle world, so I'm super excited. Maybe we can do a case study on this and figure out what exactly is going on. Um, but with all systems, they are um, quite complex. So I think if we um, take a look at what products you're using and, and possibly come out and see um, what your, your, your terrain is like and take a look at some cow um, pads and see which dung beetles we do have, we can figure out a way that we can promote the, the growth of these organisms. So one way or the other, I'm sure we can figure out what's going on with your situation there, Tim. Okay. Well, if there are any other questions, let's get them typed in real quick. Otherwise, I really appreciate your guys' time this evening. Uh, everybody that's on, we are recording this. So if you want to see it, again, you know, pick up, make some notes, do whatever. Uh, it will be on Frontier Extension District's website uh, probably in another day or two. So uh, with that, I don't say anything else. Cassandra, AJ, thank you very much for your time this evening. Always a pleasure. 
All right. Thank you. Good night.